title of my message is Why God Chose You. Ephesians 1 is our text. Quick question. Do you know any cheapskates? If you know a cheapskate, raise your hand. Okay. You know what I mean by a cheapskate, right? A kind of miserly, you know, they, they pinch their pennies. They, they don't like to give their money for anything, anywhere. They're notorious bad, notoriously bad at leaving tips. Uh, when you go out to eat a meal with these people, uh, they always disappear when the check comes. They, they have to go to the bathroom, and they're gone for 15 minutes. And when they return, they'll say, the check came? And uh, that's the way they are. How many of you are cheapskates? Raise your hand. Okay, you'll get this view, and you seem rather proud of it. All right? <laughs> no, interestingly, I've discovered often that those that have the most give the least, and those that have the least give the most. There are exceptions to this, of course, but let me illustrate with a woman from many years ago. She lived in the 1900s. Her name was Hetty Green. At one point, she was the richest woman in the world. She was also dubbed America's greatest miser. <laughs> when she died in 1916, she left an estate valued at about $200 million. Now, that's a lot back then. Today, that would be upwards of a four. $3 billion. But Hetty Green was so miserly, she ate cold oatmeal every morning so she didn't have to spend the money heating the water. She wore an old black dress and undergarments she changed only when they wore out. She once spent half a night searching for a lost stamp worth two cents. When her son, this is all true, <laughs> When her son had a severe leg injury, she took so long trying to find a free clinic to treat him, his leg had to be amputated because of advanced infection. And it was said that she hastened her own death by bringing on a fit of apoplexy while arguing the merits of skim milk because it was cheaper than whole milk. <laughs> Hetty lived like a pauper when she was a millionaire in her day. In our day, she would have been a billionaire. He said, well, why are we talking about Hetty Green? Because she is sort of a picture of a lot of Christians today. See, I don't know how much you know about what God has done for you. But a lot of believers go through life always struggling. They seem to have no spiritual power or resources to draw upon. Let me rephrase that. They have it, but maybe they don't know it. Or if they know it, they certainly don't use it. They're always struggling year after year. Decade after decade, it just goes on in a perpetual struggle. Well, that's where the book of Ephesians come in, comes in. Because this book was written to Christians who might not realize how much God has done for them. Uh, Ephesians has been dubbed the Believer's Bank or the Christian's Checkbook. It talks a lot about what the Lord has done for us. So this is the beginning of a brand new series that I'm calling Live, Love, and Fight. And in this great epistle, the Apostle Paul is going to tell us about what God has done for us and how to live full, productive, and effective Christian lives. It tells us how to lay hold of what the Lord has given us and utilize it in our lives. Now, I don't know if you've ever gone to your ATM and and had your card declined, or had a credit card declined, for that matter. I was uh, out of state not long ago, and, and my, I was at Target getting some things, and, and we had the bag there, everything had been checked, and my credit card was declined. Well, the reason was, not that I had insufficient funds, was because they thought it was fraud, because I didn't live in that state, and the credit card machine people, whatever it is, uh, you know, immediately cut my card out, so I had to go back and you know, get it working again and so forth and face the humiliation. Hundreds of people stood and pointed at me laughing. It was a very traumatic experience. That's not true. But um, maybe we feel that way. You know, we go to the spiritual ATM machine, so to speak, and we see a zero balance. No, there's so much in your spiritual bank account you couldn't spend it in a hundred lifetimes. Listen to this. God's heavenly bank has no limita limitations or restrictions, so you don't have to be spiritually deprived and, de and de uh, depleted or defeated. Uh, 
God's heavenly resources are more than adequate to cover your past debts, all of your present liabilities, and all your future needs, and it will not deplete your assets one bit. That's what justification is. That's a word that we find in the Bible. Maybe you've heard it used and you wonder what it means. Justify, one way to simplify it, to translate it, to make it understandable, could almost be translated just as if it never had happened. Just as if it never had happened. We've all done things. Oh, I wish, I wish I did not do that. I wish that it had not happened. Well, when you're justified, in a sense, it's just as if it never had happened. Now, it did happen. You did the wrong thing, but God forgives you of all of your sin. Now, if that's all he did, that would be more than enough, but he forgives you of your sin. Then he places the righteousness of Jesus Christ into your spiritual bank account. So this is a book where we where we learn how to live, and we also learn how to love. Uh, when we get to Ephesians chapter 5, uh, Paul deals in depth with the family. In fact, it's the definitive chapter that's usually referenced whenever we talk about the role of the family. That's so important in our culture. culture. So there we learn how to love. And then finally, when we get to Ephesians chapter 6, we learn how to fight. Because there we learn about the whole armor of God that every believer needs to put on. Live, love, and fight. So let's talk now a little bit about what God has done for us. Uh, certain phrases are used many times in the book of Ephesians. Uh, for instance, in chapter 1, verse 7, Paul speaks of the riches of God's grace. Then in chapter 3, verse 8, he speaks of the unfathomable unfathomable can't even say that word, um, the many, riches of Christ. And then in chapter 3, verse 16, he talks about the riches of his glory. In fact, the word riches is used five times in this book, the word grace 12 times, the word glory eight times, fullness filled up and fills, those phrases are used six times, and the key phrase, in Christ, is used 15 times. So I think we understand that God has done a lot for us. Now, let's understand the context. This was written to the believers living in Ephesus. Ephesus was a significant city. It was the capital of the Roman province of Asia. It was a busy commercial port. It was wealthy and affluent. And it was the headquarters of the cult of the goddess Diana. And these people, in fact, had a riot there on one occasion that's recorded in the book of Acts when Paul was preaching. In fact, when we went to Ephesus on one of our trips, uh, I wanted to illustrate who this idol was. So they actually sell the little idol Diana. Uh, so I actually bought one. And uh, so I, I was using it to illustrate. And I was giving a message for the people and, and talking about it. It was all about this silly little idol. Well, I took the idol and I kept it in my bag. I forgot about it. And I, I, we, we got on a boat. We were on a, actually a cruise, a Bible cruise. And so uh, we're on the boat and I look over and my granddaughters are playing with the idol like it's a doll. And I'm thinking, okay, this just isn't good because technically this is an idol. And we are to have no other gods before him. So I took that stupid idol and I went out on the deck of the ship and I threw it into the water. So I get rid of these Crazy idols. Well, this is the environment and the backdrop of this book. These were believers who were trying to live a godly life in a place where idolatry was blatant. And in addition to that, there was massive sexual immorality. So they were dealing with all of these things, trying to live a godly life in an ungodly world. Well, not much unlike our culture today. Oh, our idols are different. They're not little Goddess is called Diana. Sometimes our idols are cars. Sometimes our idols are our own bodies. Sometimes our idols are our careers or other people. We make idols out of a lot of things. But an idol is anyone or anything that takes the place of God in our lives. So first we're going to learn about our spiritual wealth and standing before God in chapters 1 to 3. And then we're going to learn about our walk in chapter 4, verses 6 to 9, and the last part of Ephesians deals with our warfare that we are to engage in. And here's what we will learn. Before we can fight, we have to learn how to live. 
Have you ever been on a plane that's getting ready to take off and they're going through all the announcements? And one of the things they tell you is if the cabin should happen to lose oxygen, a mask will drop down, right? And what do they tell you? They say, if you're with a child, put the mask first on yourself and then on the child. And I thought to myself, well, that doesn't make sense. A poor little child is, you know, needs oxygen and I know it's mine. <sighs> I'm your father, Luke. No, that's a Darth Vader imitation. No, but, but it makes complete sense because if you don't have oxygen and you can't breathe and you can't think, how can you save the child? So first you get it on you. Now you can help the child that needs your assistance. Well, the same is true in life. How can I fight this spiritual battle? How can I help another person if I don't have what I need in my life first? So Let's check out the Believer's Bank. Let's cruise through the Christian's checkbook. We're going to read verses 1 to 7 from Ephesians 1 now. Read with me. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints, you might underline that phrase, to the saints that are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That could just as easily be translated in the heavenlies. Just as he chose us, underline those two words, we'll come back to them. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption, you might underline those three words or four words, predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Please underline those words, accepted in the beloved. We're coming back to them. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now we'll stop there. Let's start with verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now, you all know that Paul used to be named Saul, right? Saul of Tarsus. Saul was a very religious man. He was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Saul of Tarsus presided over the death of the first martyr of the church, the courageous young Stephen. Saul of Tarsus went on a rampage hunting down men and women and imprisoning them and in some cases executing them. He was a vicious killer. And he was named after the first king of Israel, King Saul. King Saul who stood head and shoulders above everybody in the country, a very tall man. So that was his name, Saul. It was a great name to have as a Jew, but after he was converted, he didn't want to be Saul anymore. Now he wanted to become Paul. <laughs> Saul, who was known for his height, and he chooses the word Paul. Now, Paul's a name that people have with great uh, pride today because we think of the Apostle Paul. But actually, I don't know if you know the meaning of the word Paul. It means little, little. So Saul of Tarsus, the great man, chooses a name little. It's like he used to be Big John, and now he's Pee Wee. Right? <laughs> that was a Pee Wee Herman imitation. Very bad one. So he changed his name. Paul's smallness became the canvas for God's bigness. Let me say that again. Paul's smallness became the canvas for God's bigness. Now it's not like Paul was trying to appear humble. You know, sometimes people talk about how humble they are. They'll say, you know, I think you're very proud, but I'm very humble. They're so humble, they drop the age. I'm humble. Okay? But if you're really humble, why are you telling me you're humble? Because if you're actually humble, you would never say it. Okay? But, so Paul wasn't trying to come off like, oh, I'm so spiritual. He was just speaking factually. And he talks about the life he used to live, the man he used to be, how ashamed he was of it. So he thought, man, I, I just need a new name. And it means little. And we often think of people like the Apostle Paul and Peter and James and John as the spiritual elite. Indeed, they were singled out by God. 
no question, but we must not forget they were ordinary men that God did extraordinary things through. Every one of them had flaws. And we often think of pastors and teachers and evangelists and worship leaders as sort of the super spiritual. But the fact is God has called every one of us to do some work. So Paul was an apostle by the will of God. But you could just as easily say Stephen architect by the will of God. John a businessman by the will of God. Mary a nurse by the will of God. Tony, an attorney, an attorney by the will of God. Jeremy, a police officer by the will of God. Listen, the highest calling of God is what God has called you to be. There is no higher thing. Uh, let's say you have chest pains. Do you really want Greg, a pastor by the will of God, to help you? Now look, I'll pray for you, but I can't help you with chest pains. No, I think you want Jim, a doctor, by the will of God. Even better, a heart surgeon by the will of God, right? You need the right person at the right place. You might say, well, no, it's a higher calling to preach. It's not a higher calling. It's a different calling. And by the way, it's not a calling I chose. I didn't aspire to be a preacher. All I ever wanted to do was draw cartoons. And my backup plan was to own a pet shop. How do you like that for <laughs> ambition? Hey, I was 17, okay, but I had some ideas of what I wanted to be. And when God started opening doors up for me to preach, I, to me it, it was absurd. Why would a person like me, a poor student in school, a person who never spoke publicly, be called to do this? I don't know why, but I do know that God called me to do it. And we're all called to do something. And in fact, Paul says this to the believers in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 7, there's different kinds of spiritual gifts, but it's the same Holy Spirit who's a source of them all. There's different kinds of service in the church, but it's the same Lord we're serving. There are different ways God works in our lives, but it's the same God who works through all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us by means of helping the entire church. Check this out. As a Christian who's been filled with the Spirit, God has placed a spiritual gift or spiritual gifts in your life. You might say, well, Greg, how do you figure out what your spiritual gifts are? Sometimes other people will see them before you do. Someone might come up to you and say, you know, I think you have a gift as a leader. I think you have a gift in this other area. Really, me? Are you kidding? Uh, one way to find out what you're good at is first find out what you're bad at. Sometimes one of the best ways to discover your gifting is volunteer for everything. Hey, I'll help in the children's ministry. Okay, I'm horrible at that. Okay, I'll help over here. I really messed that up. Okay, I'll help over here. And then one day you find your sweet spot. Like, hey, this is what God has gifted me to be. Now understand, a gift from God is different than a talent. And we have talents to do certain things. Some are artistic, some are musical, some are great with numbers, some are, are great with fixing things. You know, we have talents God has given, but a gift is supernatural, and God places it in your life. And I'm telling you, God has given you gifts of the Spirit. So pray about what they may be. Then Paul goes on to say something surprising there in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, some of the parts that seem weakest and least important are really the most necessary. A lot of times we don't notice the people that work behind the scenes. For instance, my heart and my liver and my mind don't get as much attention as my eyes or my hand or my voice because those are out on display. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but I'm actually a hand model. Uh, oh, it's true. I was contacted by a magazine. They said, we want to use your hand on the cover of our magazine. I was honored. I said, what is the name of your magazine? He said, the, the, the name of the magazine is Old and Decomposing. Well, I, you know, <laughs> that was offensive. So now Paul speaks to these believers and starts off by saying, to the saints that are in Ephesus. And I pointed out before that saint is just another word for believer. Saint is not a word to describe someone who's been acknowledged by the Catholic Church or who has performed certain miracles. No, a saint is a believer. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a saint. So you've just been sainted. You don't have to call me Saint Gregory if you don't want to. But hey, I'm a saint. 
Now, it's interesting to the saints that are in Ephesus. Now, in some of the ancient manuscripts of, of the book of Ephesians, there's a blank space instead of Ephesus. So it's a, the, Paul, the apostle writing to the saints in, and there's a blank spot. And some believe because of that, this was a circular letter. In other words, it wasn't meant only for the Ephesians, but it was meant for many churches. And certainly, we're benefiting from it right now. So you could just as easily say, Paul, an apostle by the will of God, to the saints that are at harvest. You could even personalize it and put your name in there. It's God's letter to you. Look at verse 3. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Notice it's has. Or if you have a King James Bible, hath. Which means it's done. It doesn't say that one day he will. It is saying he has already done this. See, a lot of times as Christians we're asking for something that God has already given us. It would be like someone giving you a gift for your birthday. And, and as you're holding the gift, you then said, so what are you getting me for my birthday? Uh, why don't you open the box I just gave you? Oh, I just want to know what you're getting me. What, what are you, an idiot? Open the box. And we can be that way. God, what are you, when are you going to give me this? God says, newsflash, you have it. Check your balance. It's already there. For instance, we ask God to give us more love. Lord, I need more love. And yet the Bible tells us in Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. It's already there. Just start loving. Don't pray for an emotion. Just start doing it. Get it? So, you know, man, that person, they, I get so upset when I see them. I need more love. No, you need to do more loving things. Just go and do something out of your comfort zone, like saying, how are you? I love you. you. You look great. Or, you know, do a favor for them. Do loving things and the emotions will catch up. This is certainly true in marriage. Because sometimes those husbands and wives that, you know, we love so much, then they start getting on our nerves. And those things, the things that once drew you together because opposites do attract, right? Now drive you crazy. Now you could not find more two opposite people on the face of the earth than Greg and Kathy Laurie. I mean, it, everything is different about us. You know, Kathy is neat and I'm messy. Uh, Kathy is cute and I'm fat. Uh, you know how it is. The things we watch on TV, she, the things she wants to watch are not the things I want to watch. All right, so that's okay. So love, and we'll get to that later when we talk about marriage. Or you may pray for peace. Lord, give me peace. But Jesus says in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. We pray for happiness and joy. And yet John 15, 11, Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full and overflowing. We ask for strength. But yet his word tells us, Philippians 4.13, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And then 2 Peter 1.3, God's divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. You have all of the peace, all of the love, all of the power that you need. So just start using it. Take hold of it. That's what is being communicated here. Verse 3, he has, past tense, blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And where is that spiritual blessing? In the heavenlies. Or some translations say in the heavenly places. Now, where is this exactly? It just means that all these things that God has given us are up in some cloud somewhere and some planet in a distant galaxy. No, it means that they're in the unseen world of spiritual reality, the invisible world. You know, a Christian is a person who effectively lives in two worlds simultaneously. Um, I live in this place. I live on this earth. But yet I am a citizen of heaven as well. And because of this, I, I see things differently than other people see them. And I realize that this world is my home in a sense right now. But I'm going to go to my heavenly home one day in the future. And that's a great comfort to know. You know, when I travel to foreign countries, uh, I always miss home. I mean, I, I want to get home, and I want to eat what I think is American food. 
which is Mexican food and Italian food. <laughs> it's interesting because it's not really American in origin, is it now? But I like the way we do Mexican food and Italian food in America. And, and those are the things I crave. I really want those things. Maybe sushi too. Um, but you know, you're in this other place and so you have language barriers, you have things you don't completely understand. One thing that's challenging is, is getting your money uh, into the different currency because you know, you may not know how much you're spending. I was in Israel a while back and I went to an ATM machine, I took some money out. I didn't really know how much money I had because I didn't know what the exchange rate was and after I tipped some guy $20 to carry my bag, Someone told me, do you know how much money you just gave him? And I was a little alarmed by that and, and figured it out quickly. But uh, the thing we need to understand is that we're in two worlds, but God has given us these resources and they're at our disposal. In a sense, I'm in the heavenlies. I'm in the spiritual world. Right now, if God were to pull the veil back, it would blow your little mind. Because you would see angels and you would see demons, and you would see the swirl of supernatural activity that is around you every single day. Uh, in the Old Testament, we read the story of uh, Elijah and his servant, and they were surrounded by the enemy, and Elijah was sleeping, and the servant was panicking when he saw these armies closing in, and he woke up the prophet and said, what are we going to do? And Elijah, oh man, I got to get back to sleep. Lord, ju just open his eyes, he said. And then the man's eyes was open and he saw the supernatural world, the angels of the Lord all around him. And he realized that those that are with us are more than those that are with them. So we may not see it, but trust me, it's there. Okay, now we're going to come to a very big subject. I'm going to talk about something the church has <coughs> discussed and debated for 2,000 years. And I'm going to resolve it right now. He said jokingly. I'm talking about predestination or divine election. Look at verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Listen to this. God chose you before you chose him. Jesus said, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Before there was a planet called Earth, before there was a garden called Edom, Eden, not Edom, I don't know what Edom is. <laughs> Even before Edom and Eden, before there was a man named Adam and a woman named Eve, God decided in the councils of eternity to choose you and to choose me. Well, of course, the first question that comes to my mind is, why? Why would God choose me? What goodness or merit did he see in me that he would choose me to be his child? I hope you're not disappointed in the answer I'm going to give you. The answer is there was no merit or goodness that caused God to choose you. It's clear that despite your best intentions or high opinion you may hold of yourself that has nothing to do with it. All you need to know is God did it before you were even born. And so imagine if you knew the future, if you were God, you knew everything that was going to happen. What would you do? I mean, if one day you had the superpower, if you will, of knowing the future. Well, I'd, I'd go down to the racetrack, <laughs> and I would know which horse is going to win, and I would bet a lot of money on that horse. So what you're telling me is you'd try to profit from it, and what you're telling me is you would certainly pick a winner. Would you go down to the racetrack with this foreknowledge of the future and say, I'm going to choose the horse that's going to lose? No, why would you do that? No, you would choose a winner. Despite that, God, knowing all things, chose me. He chose you. But why? Because we fall short so many times, don't we? I think the same answer uh, could be given as to why he chose Israel. The Lord said of the nation of Israel, The Lord did not set his love upon you or choose you because you were more in number than other people, for you were fewer. 
The Lord chose you. Ready for the answer? He chose you because he loves you. Why? I don't know. Just roll with it. This is a good thing. You say, I don't understand it. Nobody understands it. And anyone that thinks they do is either lying or delusional. It's been said, quote, try to explain divine election and you may lose your mind. Try to explain it away and you may lose your soul. See, it's very important that this is, that we understand this is something the Bible teaches. Now, we might ask the question, well, how? How did God choose us? What was the basis for his choice? I don't have an answer for that particular uh, question. Now, some, those who would be of the Reformed persuasion, Calvinists, as they're sometimes called, uh, believe in something called irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. That effectively means that God chose you before you chose him, and you're going to believe in him no matter what. That's already been settled and decided, and you couldn't even resist the grace and the pull of God if you wanted to. And then some uh, of the same persuasion would be believe in what we might describe as double predestination. Meaning that God chose some people for heaven and he chose other people for hell. So it's sort of like, okay, heaven, heaven, hell, hell, heaven, heaven, hell, hell, heaven, hell. Really? I don't believe that. I reject that completely. That God chose certain people to go to hell. I think this contradicts what other scriptures teach. Along these same lines, they would believe in what is called limited atonement. And that simply means that Christ only died for the elect. He only died for those that he chose ahead of time. Well, I don't believe in that either. I believe that Christ died for the whole world. And I believe, that's right. And I believe the grace of God can be resisted. That's why the Bible tells us to not resist the Holy Spirit. He can be resisted. God has given us a free will. Scripture is clear in pointing out that God gives us a choice in the matter. Of course, the definitive verse is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. It doesn't say for God so loved only the elect or chosen ones. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever, it, say, it doesn't say so when the elect who cannot resist his grace believe. No, whosoever. This is an open invitation to all of humanity. Whether we like it or not, the Bible teaches both predestination and free will. Now I could illustrate it like this. Let's say you're cruising down the freeway of life, so to speak. You're just going with the flow. You're empty, you're frustrated, and you're alone. And you are driving by and you notice an off-ramp. And off that little off-ramp, there is a building with a door, and on the outside of the door it says, whosoever will, let him come. You see a couple people pulling off, but most of the people are charging ahead. You know, and you just keep driving that freeway every day, and you keep noticing that little road, whosoever will, let him come. Now, you've actually talked with people that have gone through that door, and they talk about how wonderful it is, how great it is, and you think about doing it, but you're afraid. And then one day you think, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to do it. And so you pull over and you op get out of your car and you open the door. Whosoever will, let him come. And then you walk in and shut the door. And on the other side of the door, on the inside, it says, chosen in Christ from the foundation of the world. Get it? You chose, but God chose too. He chose you, you chose him. But you did have a choice in the matter. And that's a glorious thing. And you know what else? He chose you before you were born. The great preacher C.H. Spurgeon once said, it's a good thing God chose me before I was born because if he had waited until after, he would have changed his mind. <laughs> now, Spurgeon said that tongue in cheek because God knew exactly who you would become. He knows your strengths as well as your weaknesses. So as D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, said, the whosoever wills are the elect, the whosoever won'ts are the non-elect. It's not like God saying, you know, I choose you for heaven and I choose you for hell. God says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You could put it this way. God predestines every man to be saved. The devil predestines, if you will, every man to be damned. Man casts the deciding vote. You decide 
where you will spend eternity. But once you make that decision and believe in Jesus, you just confirmed you are the chosen one. God chose you. So I don't get it. I don't get it either. But this is a reality that we need to accept. And some will say, well, I think we have to be very careful because I don't think we can say God loves you to a non-believer because if they're not the elect, then God doesn't really love them, does he? And, and if someone prays a prayer and they're not one of the elect and we tell them Jesus came in their heart and we're giving them false assurance, are you crazy? How are we going to go into all the world and preach the gospel if we believe that? I don't know who God has chosen. I don't know who God has not chosen. Again, to quote the evangelist Theo Moody, Lord, save the elect, and then elect some more. I mean, I acknowledge that salvation is a work of God. There's nothing I can say to convince a person to believe in Jesus. I've had people come up to me and say, Greg, what is the one thing you can say to make a person believe? Like, they think that, you know, we evangelists have some little secret card in our pocket or something. Okay, it's time to say that one thing. All right, let me ask you this. And you read it and boom, they believe no such thing. I just know it's a work of the Spirit. Jesus said in John 6, 44, no man comes to me unless the Father who has sent me draws them. So it's up to the work of God. But our job, Colossians 1, 28, is to proclaim Christ, warning everyone we meet and teaching everyone we can all that we know about him. It's our job to reach as many people as possible. That's why we do our evangelistic crusades. Because we want to reach as many people as we possibly can in the shortest amount of time. That's our commission. That's what Christ has commanded us to do. To go into all the world and preach the gospel. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3, 7, neither he who plants or he who waters is anything. Only God who makes things grow. The men who plants, the men who waters have one purpose and each will be rewarded according to their labor for God's fellow workers. You are God's field and God's building. We all have a part to play. Some sow a seed. Some water the seed that has been sown. Some reap where others have sown and watered. But it is God that ultimately brings about that conversion. There's an interesting passage in Acts 13, 48, where Paul was preaching to a group of Gentiles, non-Jews. And we read, When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as been appointed to eternal life believed. And I keep that in mind when I'm giving an invitation. Because we've had thousands come forward in one invitation. and in others, we've had three come forward. And, and I just remember, Lord, as many as are appointed to eternal life, they'll believe. I leave this in your hand. I, and I just trust that God's spirit will work and do the thing that he wants to do. So we just need to do our part and let God do his part. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, whoever will, let him call upon the name of the Lord and he will be saved. Now, we'll talk a lot about the why of predestination. We'll talk also a lot about the what of predestination. But I think what we miss, and that is so important, is what did he predestinate me for? Why did God choose me? What am I predestinated for? The answer is right here in Ephesians 1. If you're taking notes, you might write this down. Number one, God predestinated me to be adopted into his family. He predestinated me to be adopted into his family. Look at verse 5. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. God chose you to be adopted into his family and to become his child. Because God wants you to walk in fellowship, relationship, and friendship with him. Romans 8.15 says, You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear. You have received a spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. This is something God lovingly does for us. He adopts us. 1 John 3 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the sons of God. I want you to notice in verse 5, it says, according to the good pleasure of his will. In other words, God loves doing it. Don't you love to bless people? Have you figured it out yet that, as Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive? You know, when you're a kid, 
Uh, you look forward to your birthday or Christmas because you're going to get a lot of stuff, right? And as you get older, first of all, you don't even want to acknowledge birthdays anymore, right? And you want them just to be over with. And you actually enjoy getting things for people more than receiving things from people. And here's God. He's saying, you know, I just love to bless you. And I just love to provide for you. It's sort of like when I take my grandchildren out, maybe I'll, I'll buy them dinner and then I'll get them a dessert. Maybe I'll get them a little toy or something like that. You know, that's not something I do out of duty. Like, oh, man, this is such a drag, these stupid kids, you know. No, I love them. And I love to be with them. It's not my duty. It's my joy and I enjoy it. And God feels the same way about you. Jesus said, fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's God's pleasure. You know, if someone does something for you, you say, thank you. What do they say? My pleasure. My pleasure. And this is God's pleasure to do this. Number two, God predestinated me to be holy and without blame. To be holy and without blame. Look at verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Why? That we would be holy and without blame before him in love. This is the outgrowth of your relationship with God. Holiness speaks of your inward purity. Without blame speaks of your outward condition of purity. So he wants you to have a pure heart and he wants you to be pure in your actions. If you're really a Christian and you know what it is to walk with Christ, it should affect you in the things that you say, the things that you do, even in the things that you think. And if it is not affecting you in your lifestyle, in your choices, then we have to wonder if you really even understand this to begin with. See, you were like a slave on the open market for sale. You were chained up to a tree. And there were no takers. The auctioneer called out. Nobody wanted you. They wouldn't pay full price. They wouldn't pay half price. And along comes Jesus. He takes one look at you and he says, I choose you. And so he pays the price. And he pays full price. He doesn't try to get a deal. He pays full price. He says, come on. You're like, wow, I can't believe he did this for me. I'm going to be the best servant ever. I will serve this master. I'll go wherever he wants to go. Where do you want to go, master? I want to go down to the courthouse. Okay, master, here I come. Uh, what are we going to do there? Actually, I'm going to adopt you as my son. What? No, I don't want you to be like a servant like you were before. You can serve me voluntarily, but I want you to be my son. I want you to be my daughter. So let's drop those adoption papers and you can bear my name now. Christian. Because you follow me, and I live in you, and you are in Christ. You know, when we mess up, and we sin as followers of Jesus, we're ashamed. And sometimes we may feel as though we lost our position. Hey, I'm no longer his son. I'm no longer his daughter. I'm not worthy. I'm not. Listen, you never were worthy. So get over the worthy thing. You'll never be worthy. You never were worthy. It's not about that. It's about the fact that God loves you and he chose you. So when you mess up, do you stop being his child? Remember the story of the prodigal son? He went a long ways from home. Took his cut of the inheritance long before it should have been divided up. A great inconvenience to the father. He drugged the family name to the gutter. He consorted with hookers. He messed his life up and he ended up broke and hurting and miserable and even hungry. There was no food. So one day the boy reasoned, I'm just going to go home and I'm going to say, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just hire me. Give me a job. I'll do anything. And he probably repeated that speech over and over again. And so he's making his way home. And, and then when he's at a distance, the father sees his son coming he bolts up from the chair, runs as fast as he can, and then starts beating his son. Really, No, I, that didn't happen, did it? Did the boy deserve that? Perhaps. But the father throws his arms around him. And you can be sure this kid stunk. He was living with pigs. Have you ever smelled a pig? Imagine living with them for a while. Talk to my wife if you need a reference. Um, he smelled, his, his clothes were tattered. He looked horrible. He was filthy. 
The father throws his arms around him. And this is what the father says. This son of mine was dead and he's alive again. And he was lost. He's found. Let's have a party. You see the boys reciting and saying, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Son, <laughs> welcome home. Hey, everybody, my son's come back. Let's have a party together. Do you think that son was grateful for what the father did for him? So too we should be grateful for all that God has done for us. Perhaps one of the reasons we do so little for the Lord is because we don't realize how much he has done for us. Let that sink in. 1 John says, 419, we love him because he first loved us. Listen, the more you know about God's love for you, the more you will grow in your love for him. So just take a while and soak it in. Now we come to point number three. God shows us that we might become more and more like Jesus every day. Again, God shows us that we might be more and more like Jesus every day. Romans 8, 28 to 29, we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to His pur purpose. For whom He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed into the image of His own dear Son. A lot of times people miss the big picture of that verse. Everyone knows Romans 8, 28. But they forget that after Romans 8, 28, it's Romans 8, 29. And that's the whole story. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for those that love God. Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his own dear son. So we have things happen in life that make no sense to us. And we say, God, I don't know why this is happening. But Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. And, and that's okay to quote that, by the way. I'm not making fun of it. But then as a little time goes by, something happens. You realize that that bad thing resulted in a good thing. And you're saying, Lord, you're so good. It all worked out. But there are times in life when something really bad happens. And you quote Romans 8, 28. And you don't see how it's working together for good. You don't see any good. You just see pain and more pain. I know this from personal experience. When the Lord called our son to heaven. It was just like, what is, where's the good here? But then I thought of verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his own dear son. See, God's end game with you is to make you like Jesus. God's end game is not to make you happy, it's to make you holy. That comes as a revelation to some of us. We just thought God was there to make us happy. Well, he wants to make you holy, but the great thing is happiness is a byproduct of holiness. You know, if you live a holy life, you'll be a happy person. But if you don't live a holy life, you'll be the unhappiest person around. So what this means is everything is in play still. So for those things in your life that don't make sense, just hang on. Maybe they'll make sense in a year or in 10 years. Or maybe they will never make sense this side of heaven. But when you get into God's presence on the other side, it'll all come into focus and you go, now I get it. You see? But God shows you that you might be more like Jesus every day. Let me ask you, are you becoming more like Jesus? Can people see it? That's a great compliment when someone says, man, you have changed. You are not the same person you used to be. I remember how short-tempered you were. I remember this thing about you and that thing about you. And now you're like a whole new you. And that's the greatest compliment ever. Especially when it comes from a non-believer that you haven't seen for a while. That's God's goal, to make you like Jesus. Fourth and finally, God shows us that we might bring forth spiritual fruit. God shows us that we might live spiritually fruitful lives. Jesus said in John 15, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give to you. What does that mean to bear fruit? It means to... Bring results out. Uh, the Bible says, by their fruits you will know them. And when someone's really walking with Christ, you'll see the fruit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? According to Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and it's joy, and it's peace, and it's patience, and it's long-suffering. So if you're a follower of Jesus, those should be the earmarks of your life. People should be able to see that in you and see that in me. Here's something else God has done for you. And I don't want you to miss this because this is really big. Look at verse 6. To the praise of his grace, 
excuse me, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Say that after me. Accepted in the beloved. What does that even mean? It means that right now I stand before God and you stand before God as a follower of Jesus completely acceptable. Uh, there's nothing I've done to earn it, but I'm accepted, acceptable to God. I heard a song on the radio the other day, a Christian radio station. A girl was singing, it's your approval I long for, she sang. I thought, why would I sing that? You don't have to long for the approval of God. You have the approval of God. The Bible says so. It says he's made you accepted in the beloved. You're not merely forgiven and justified and cleansed of your sin. You've been received and loved by God himself. And you know why that is? It's because of his deep love for his own son. And because his son lives in me, now I have his favor. You have God's approval because of what Christ did for you, not because of what you did for Christ. And what we could describe as the true Lord's Prayer, John 17. Often we call that prayer, you know, our Father who art in heaven, the Lord's Prayer. You know, we can call it that. But actually it would better be described as the disciples' prayer because it was not a prayer that Jesus ever prayed. Jesus never prayed to the Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us because Jesus never sinned. He gave it in a response to the request of his disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. But in the true Lord's Prayer, the prayer that only Christ himself could pray, recorded in John 17. You ought to go check it out and read it through a beautiful prayer. But in that prayer, listen to what he says. This is Jesus talking to the Father. He says to the Father, may they experience, speaking of us, his followers, may they experience such perfect unity that the world may know that you sent me and that you, listen to this, and that you love them as much as you love me. Did you hear that? God loves you as much as he loves Jesus Christ. Do you think the Father loves Jesus Christ? Oh yeah. It's his only begotten son. His dearly beloved son. And he loves you just as much because of what Jesus did for you. Listen to this. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he had personally committed every sin ever committed by every person who would believe, though he committed none of them. Let me repeat that again. On the cross, God the Father treated Jesus as if he had personally committed every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe, though he committed none of them. This is called the doctrine of substitution. It means that God punished Jesus on the cross as though he lived your life. The Bible says that he became the righteousness of God in him. Jesus lived to the age of 33 while he was on this earth. The other, not to got two of my granddaughters for a dinner, Stella and Lucy. Somehow we got on the subject of heaven uh, and uh, we started talking about how old we'll be in heaven. I think it was Stella that asked, Papa, how old will we be in heaven? And I thought, I, I said, well, how old would you like to be? And I don't remember what Stella said, maybe eight or nine. And, and then they said, well, how old do you want to be in heaven, Papa? I said, yeah, I think I want to be 33 years old. And Stella said, that was the age of Daddy Christopher when he went to heaven. And I said, yes, Stella. And it was also the age of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. And all of a sudden, a light went off in Stella's head. And she turned to me and said, then it must have been for a reason. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> okay. Then little Lucy, I asked her, how old do you want to be in heaven? She says, two. <laughs> two. Why do you want to be two in heaven? She says, because I miss the old me. funny. We're almost done here. Why did Jesus have to live 33 years? I mean, realistically, he could have accomplished everything he wanted to do over the weekend. Why 33 years? Answer, because he came and lived the perfect life. He was righteous in every thought. Can you imagine how hard it would have been to be one of the siblings of Jesus? Perfect boy. The mom would say, now boys, why can't you be more like Jesus? 
mom. He's like, perfect. Yeah, but boys, I made a little bracelet for you to wear. WWJD. And I want you to, and whenever, whatever you're looking at things, that do, just ask yourself the question, what would Jesus do? He was perfect. He lived a perfect life. Never sinned. Never a sinful thought in his mind. He passed every test. Now listen to this. Because of that, now you are treated as if you had lived the perfect life. Perfect life? I haven't even lived a perfect day. I'm not sure I've lived a perfect hour without some kind of sin entering in. He lived the perfect life on this earth as though you were righteous in every thought and as though you passed every test. See, God has put that into your account. He took your sins out and he put the righteousness of Christ in its place. He says, now that's how I see you. So stop saying, oh, I'm not worthy. You never were worthy. You're accepted in the beloved. When I see you, I see Jesus. And I love him and I love you. We're related. You're my son. You're my daughter. That's the way it is. Now, I don't want to come off like a shrink here, but <laughs> maybe you had a cold, distant father. Now, sometimes men, you know, they don't want to be strong. They don't want to show weakness. So they won't affirm their children. They might affirm someone else's children first. But you either say, well, you should try a little harder. You could do a little better. You don't remember your father ever saying, you know, I am so proud of you. And I love you so much. And, and you're the best. You know, maybe your father never did that. So because of that, you sort of brought that along with you to your relationship with your father in heaven. You know, I don't know if really I please God. And I don't know if I'm good enough or if I'm worthy enough. Hey, newsflash, your father in heaven is not like your father on earth. Now, maybe your father on earth was awesome. And if he was, great. But even the awesome father on earth doesn't come close to the awesomeness of your father in heaven. But don't think of your father in heaven the way you think of your father on earth. Know that he looks at you with love. He looks at you with approval. He looks at you with acceptance. Oh, cool. So I can just go out and do any sin I want? No, you're missing the point. Remember, he chose you that you should be holy before him. So some people say, well, God loves me the way that I am. Yeah, but he doesn't want to leave you that way. Back to the story of the prodigal son. He came home. The father threw his arms around him. He accepted him. But then he said, give this boy a bath, for starters, and put new clothes on him and a new ring in his finger. So he accepted him, but then he changed him. And some people will live in sin and say, well, God loves me the way that I am and God accepts me. Well, you're misunderstanding it because if you know anything of God choosing you and loving you, it should cause you to want to live a holy life and bring honor and glory to his name and bear spiritual fruit. So God chose us and it's a great thing. So maybe some of you are wondering in closing, well, how do I know if I'm chosen? Okay, I've got the answer. You ready? How do you know if you're chosen? It's very simple. Believe in Jesus Christ and you just proved you were chosen. Don't believe in Jesus Christ? Well, I guess you weren't, were you? You see, there's God's grace, but it can be resisted. There's God's offer of forgiveness, but it can be turned away. Now the ball's in your court. You cast the deciding vote, if you will. And there might be some of you listening right now who have never asked Jesus to come into your life. Maybe you've gone to church for years. You've never even known how much God loved you or what God did for you. But you can't remember a moment when you said, Jesus, be my Savior and my Lord. So you can't live off somebody else's relationship with God. You, had to come to, you have to come to Christ on your own and believe in Him. And how did Jesus show His love for us? He came and died on the cross in our place and shed His blood. And then he rose again from the dead. And he'll come and live in your heart and in your life right now if you will ask him in. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you'll hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Would you like Jesus to come into your life right now? Would you like to confirm that you're chosen by God? Would you like to be certain that you'll go to heaven when you die? Would you like all of your sins forgiven and forgotten? And would you like the righteousness of Christ placed into your life? You might say, no. Really, no? 
No. So what do you have that's better than that? I'm just stuff. Now think clearly. Think clearly. Don't let somebody else do your thinking for you. Stop marching in lockstep with everybody else because everybody else this is, says this is the thing to do. Think for yourself. Get off that freeway leading to death and get on that narrow road that leads to life. And you see that door that has written over it, whosoever will let him come, that's for you. You want it? God will give it to you. In a moment we're going to pray and I'll give you an opportunity to believe in Jesus and to have your sin forgiven. Let's all bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your word to us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for dying on the cross and shedding your blood for all of our sin. Now we pray for every person here who does not yet know you. Help them to see their need for you and help them to come to you, we pray. Now when our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, how many of you would say tonight, I want Jesus Christ to come into my life. I want him to forgive me of my sin. I want to be certain that when I die, I will go to heaven. I want to experience this relationship with God you've spoken of. I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. Or maybe you've fallen away from him and you want to come back to him like that prodigal son did. You can come to. So if you want your sin forgiven, if you want Christ to come into your life, or if you want to come back to the Lord tonight, I want you to raise your hand up wherever you are. Just raise your hand up where I can see it. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand. God bless. Raise your hand up. God bless you. You want Christ to come into your life. You want him to forgive you of your sin. Raise your hand up. You want to come back to the Lord because you've fallen away. Raise your hand. God bless you. All right, now I'm going to ask that every one of you who has raised their hand, I want you to stand to your feet. Stand up. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Right where you are. Stand up. You heard me, right? That's it. Stand up. Others are standing. You won't be the only one. Stand now. Hey, think for yourself. This is your moment. Come to Jesus. No matter what you've done, he'll forgive you. But you must come to him. Stand up. Anybody else? You want his forgiveness. Or you've fallen away from the Lord. And you want to come back to him. Stand up and we'll pray together. I'll wait one more moment. God bless you. Anybody else? Stand now. God bless all of you standing. Now I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. And I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. And this is a prayer of asking Jesus to come into your life. Again, as I pray, pray this out loud after me. Okay? Pray this out loud after me. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. But I know that you're a Savior who died on the cross and shed his blood for every sin I have ever committed. I turn from that sin now and I choose to follow you from this moment forward as Savior and Lord, as God and friend. Thank you for calling me. Thank you for choosing me. And I choose you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Praise God.